Right. Good evening, everybody. Um, so I am Dean Gunderson, the Director of Education at Seed St. Louis, and this class is Getting the Most from Your Harvest. So um, what we're really going to be talking about is not as much like how to maximize yields. Uh, we're really going to be talking about reducing waste or uh, ways to make the, the greatest use of the food that you are already growing. Um, and ways that you can kind of plan your garden um, around doing that. So the first thing is just why reduce waste? Why reduce food waste or try and use as much as possible? Um, one, because waste is food that you could have eaten. Um, you know, if you're growing food, I imagine it's because you want to eat it. Um, and so you might as well eat as much of it as you can. Also, from kind of an environmental or financial standpoint, um, it's also energy and money that you are literally throwing away or turning into incredibly, ridiculously expensive compost in the best case scenario, um, assuming you're composting. Uh, so, you know, it would be much more uh, efficient from a money, energy, time standpoint to, to eat it in one way or the other. Um, and in the United States, who Unsurprisingly, we waste the most food of anywhere in the world. Uh, nearly 40% of all the food that is grown in this country is never eaten, um, which is bonkers. Uh, and the environmental impact of wasted food is, is really high. Um, this little chart over here on the right, which I think is a USDA chart, if I'm remembering right, it was either EPA or USDA, um, talking about that, you know, just the food waste in the US accounts for 25% of all of the fresh water that we use in this country. Like, if we just didn't grow that food in the first place, because we're not eating it, we obviously don't currently need it. Um, we'd, we'd cut our water use by 25%, which would be insane. Um, the energy used is enough to power the country for more than a week, and it, and it takes up enough farmland to feed the entire world's hungry population twice. Um, so, yeah, wasted food is bad. Um, and also, according to Project Drawdown, which is a really cool um, organization, if you're interested in climate change, you should look them up, uh, that has found that reducing food waste is one of the top ways, like either somewhere between number one and three, depending on the scenario that you're looking at, is like one of the best ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, like of the, like if you're looking at like individual actions that can be done, like reducing food waste is like one of the biggest bangs for the buck. Uh, that, that we could do as a society. Uh, and one of the ways that you can contribute to that is doing it yourself. So how to do that. So this is what we're gonna be talking about tonight. Uh, first, what's important is planning your garden and your orchard. Um, you wanna grow or, or buy, you know, like if you're at the grocery store or stuff, we're mostly gonna be talking about growing because that's what we talk about, but same idea, um, what you actually eat. Um, it's good to stagger your harvests, to plan or be planting in a way that you're going to be getting harvest over a long period as opposed to all at once. Um, it's helpful to grow varieties um, of vegetables or cultivars of fruits and nuts that are ones that store well, like that were bred for that. Um, you actually want to harvest the crops, which sounds obvious, but doesn't always happen. Uh, you want to store your food well, and we'll talk about um, various different storage techniques. Um, and then you want to eat everything that you can. So, you know, we generally, when we have a crop, um, you know, we think like, oh, this is the part that you eat, but oftentimes you can eat other parts of that plant that's already there that we're just throwing away for the most part. Um, but a lot of those other parts of the plant are edible. We just don't necessarily know that they are edible or what to do with them. Um, so it's important to know what is edible of what you have. Um, you can also process or convert foods um, to make them more edible edible, more palatable, more usable for the way that you're cooking. Um, and then, uh, you know, if you're not going to be eating the food directly, there's other ways to use it. Um, you can use it to grow more food. Um, some foods that you might have um, that could end up as, as waste that you either can't eat for one reason or don't eat for one reason or another um, actually make really good fertilizers or disease or pest control options or um, really good food for chickens, which then turn it into eggs, which you can eat. Um, and kind of as a last resort, you know, if you can't use the food in those ways, then compost it, um, which is a way to turn that into uh, back into fertilizer, 
to grow more food. But, um, you know, oftentimes compost is thought of as like, that's kind of the first thing you do. Like compost is like the solution and compost is great, but compost should be what you do after you've exhausted all your other options if you're really looking to reduce waste. So the first thing that's important to do is to plan your garden um, and or your meals. Uh, you know, kind of think through what you actually eat um, and what you will be eating um, regularly over a period of time. So not just like, oh, I'm gonna, I need a garnish here and there. So let's grow six plants of that. Um, but thinking like, what do I, what do I actually eat? Um, and, and, you know, this is you know, just an example here. So growing a whole bunch of lettuce is worthless and will ultimately end up as waste if you don't eat a lot of lettuce. Like if you're not like a huge salad eater all the time um, and you grow like a whole bunch of lettuce heads, we can do with all that lettuce heads. You know, lettuce doesn't store very well, generally. Um, so you want to be growing reasonable amounts for what it is that you and your family actually eat on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so you want to think about that as you're actually planning your space. Um, it's great to grow new things, to try new things, um, but it generally doesn't make a lot of sense to grow a lot of that new thing if you don't know that you like it or if you don't know exactly how you would eat it. You know, it's better to grow, you know, maybe one of those plants or, you know, just a few of those plants to just kind of see how they do and to taste them. And then if you like them, grow more each year as you kind of figure out what to do with them. And yeah, once again, plant things that you regularly eat and enjoy. And this is just an example um, over here. So we did a variety uh, or a, a crop trial last year where we were trying to find uh, greens that would grow in the summer whenever there's kind of a lull in, in production of leafy greens in St. Louis for the most part. Um, and we grew six or seven different types. And a lot of them did really well. This one in particular, um, I'm sure I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, but I think it's mal malochia, um, you know, produces these nice, um, beautiful green leaves, very few pests and disease issues, and was incredibly productive. You can see this plant here. Um, uh, you know, this is, it's an annual plant and I planted this in, you know, May uh, and this was in September, October. And you can see it's like 12 feet tall, 10, 12 feet tall. Um, so it's, you know, incredibly productive, which is great. But if you don't eat it, then that production doesn't mean anything. Like it's, it's, it's just going to end up as waste um, in the garden. So, uh, you know, again, growing things that you actually consume. And then when you're, when you're planning, it's also good to try to plan in a way that will, that will stagger your harvests. So growing things that produce over a longer period um, makes it easier for you to use all of those than something that ripens all at once. Um, so you know, it, it, it can be very easy to be overwhelmed with crops that you harvest all at once. You know, if you plant a whole bed of cabbage, cabbage tend to be ripe all around or ready right around the same time. And if you've all of a sudden got 15 heads of cabbage, it, it can be like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with all this cabbage? Um, which can be stressful and often leads to you throwing a lot of cabbage away. Um, so, you know, growing things that will produce a small amount week after week after week can often make it much easier for you to use all of that food. <clears throat> so uh, just as some examples of what I kind of call like all at once crops. So those things that you can kind of get swamped with and you don't know what to do with all of them are things like cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, um, sweet corn, radishes, um, which do not store well. And you pretty much have to pick them um, when they're ready. Otherwise they'll start splitting and getting incredibly spicy. Um, so those are kind of all at once, generally speaking. Uh, but there's other things that produce over a longer period of time. So generally leafy crops um, that are non-heading. So like head lettuce, you kind of harvest all at once, but like leaf lettuce, kind of the, you know, just the loose things where you can harvest individual leaves, um, kale, collards, chard, those things where you can harvest, you know, a couple leaves as you need them and it will continue to grow. You harvest a couple leaves. Those things um, are much easier to not waste. Um, things like carrots and beets, which tend to be ready around the same time, but they just kind of hang out in the garden. Um, like they're not as demanding that they need to all be harvested at the same time and then consumed pretty quickly. Uh, tomatoes, because they'll produce, you know, usually over a long period of time. Same with peppers, eggplants, um, green beans. Generally, you're harvesting, you know, a little bit every week for 
several months. Uh, herbs, cucumbers, and summer squash are all kind of examples of, of that. So those are all things that tend to be easier to, to keep up with and to not waste. And so then, um, you know, kind of in that same vein, you can prioritize long producing options. So sometimes within crops, there's kind of two different options or there's several different options. And one of them is kind of all at once. And one of them is a small amount over a longer period of time. And those are the, generally the distinction there is that one was grown for commercial farm production and one was grown for vegetable, like backyard, like subsistence, like direct consumption uh, systems. So like pole beans. So those are the big long vining beans. Those are not easy to grow on a farm because you gotta, like if you're trying to grow green beans commercially, because you gotta have a trellis and they produce a little bit every week for months, that's a lot of labor, it's a lot of work. And so it doesn't make as much sense for a big commercial farm to do that. And so what was bred instead was bush beans, which stay short, don't need trellising, so it's less labor. They tend to, to harvest all at once or in waves where you get a whole bunch and then several weeks will pass and then you get a whole bunch. Um, so those are good if you're trying to like, get a lot of beans all at once to sell at the market or to process into canned green beans or something like that. But if you're not looking to can green beans, bush beans might not be the most efficient way to go in the garden. Pole beans, which is what your ancestors almost certainly grew, they were not growing bush beans, um, is, is gonna make a lot more sense. The same with lettuce. Head lettuce was bred for commercial farms because lettuce wilts um, pretty quickly, whereas head lettuce stays um, stays better longer because it, it's denser, it doesn't dry out as quickly, and so it works a lot better for throwing it on an ox cart and riding it into the city to sell to people, um, but you're probably not doing that. You're probably eating the lettuce out of your backyard or from your community garden, and so growing leaf lettuce, which again is what everyone growing like for their own consumption used to grow, um, makes a lot more sense because you can go out there, harvest the leaves you need that day and then leave the plants and the other leaves there and they'll continue to grow and you go out and you harvest again and you can continue to do that for a much longer period. Whereas head lettuce, you cut it once and that lettuce plant is done, it's dead. Like you've, you killed it. It's not gonna grow any more leaves for you. So, you know, selecting leaf lettuce versus head lettuce. And then collards or kale instead of say cabbage. Um, so cabbage, you know, again, was, is the same idea. Cabbage, um, one of the reasons it was bred, it, it was bred also for people to be able to store leafy greens over winter um, in their own homes, but also because it's much easier to ship a cabbage to market than it is to ship kale to market, especially when you don't have refrigerated trucks. Um, but with cabbage, you harvest the head and then it's pretty much done. Like that's what you're getting from that plant. Whereas kale or collards, you can harvest all spring, all summer, all fall, and increasingly most of winter as our winters get warmer and warmer. So just again, think, thinking through and selecting those things that you're going to have a more staggered, drawn out harvest can make it easier. And then you can also do this on your own. So especially if you like those all at once crops, um, which, you know, it's great. I also like them. This is, you know, a picture of me with cauliflower. Um, but you can you can plant your crops in a way that those all at once crops will come in waves for you, and that's called succession planting. Um, so if you succession plant your crops, you is where you will, you know, take. If, um, if I wanted to do cauliflower, for example, so I'd plant out some cauliflower, you know, in late March. And then two weeks later, I'd plant out some more cauliflower. Like, and you can do the exact same variety, like more cauliflower. And then two weeks later, I'd plant some more. And then by doing that, they're gonna mature about two weeks apart. So then instead of getting all of my cauliflower in one week, I'm gonna get a third of my cauliflower. Then I'll have two weeks to eat before I have another third of my cauliflower, which I'll have two weeks to eat before I have my, my last third of cauliflower. And then I can eat that. And so I'm drawing it out without the, the plant actually staggering the production. You, know, you are staggering the production. <clears throat> and that's the thing, especially with, uh, with root crops, it's done a lot. So radishes um, is a really easy one to get, to kind of get familiarized with succession planting because those little rad, <clears throat> excuse me, those little radishes, you know, can mature as quickly as 20 days. So, you know, plant some radishes. And then a week later, plant some more, and uh, you know, some more radishes. And then a week later, plant some more. And then a week later, plant some more. And then a week later, plant some more. And you can do that and get, you know, radishes for 
for a month or more, um, even though they're, they're taking the same amount of time, you're just planting them at different times. And so that's another thing that can be helpful. And this is just a little illustration of that with, um, I believe, bush beans. <clears throat> and then you can also grow varieties that just hold well in the garden. So some crops are just gonna do better um, just like where they're kind of mature or they're ready to be harvested, even if it's those like all at once crops where they're kind of ready to be harvested, but they don't need to be harvested right away. So again, I talked about how like, you know, small radishes are not like that. Like if you get a small radish, when it's ready, you got to pull it out. And if you don't, it's going to start cracking. It's going to get incredibly hot and spicy. Um, so like they generally will not sit in the garden for a long period of time and be okay. Um, but uh some, but other root crops, and I, again, we talked about this a couple slides ago, like beets and carrots especially, tend to be okay sitting in the garden for a while. Like, and you can just kind of harvest them later and they'll still be good. And so this uh, can also, this can be particularly helpful with, uh, with greens, heading greens. You know, if you really do like head lettuce or, you know, romaine lettuce, or if you like bok choy, which I absolutely love, those can be great, but you know, they, most of the time they will, they can bolt when it gets hot. And so like when they're ready, like oftentimes you feel pressure, like I got to harvest it because if I don't, it's going to bolt and then it's not any good. And then I wasted all of that time. So growing thing, ones that are, that are naturally bolt resistant can be really helpful. So with, um, uh, with bok choy, this is just an example here that you can see. So, you know, these are, are two different varieties of bok choy and you can see this one on the right is bolting. Like this bok choy is not good. It's bitter. Um, it's getting tough. It's not, it's not very tasty over here. Whereas this variety, and these were planted at the exact same time, they obviously went through the exact same heat. This one hasn't bolted yet. And actually this one over here, we just left in the garden to see how long it would hold. And it held a full two months after this one bolted, just sitting there in the garden. And then when we harvested it, it was still good. And so, you know, growing those varieties that are, that just naturally hold in the garden better can also really help avoid waste. Because if I saw like, oh my gosh, they're gonna bolt and I had to harvest this whole bed of like 30 bok choy heads, there's no way I could eat all of that. I mean, it, it's just not, I mean, there would be waste. And so uh, so that's another way that can be helpful. And these are just some varieties here that you can look at that hold um, particularly well in the garden. And then there are also just certain um, varieties or cultivars that store longer. Uh, so uh, this would be like what, once you harvest them, like they're more, they, they hold longer than other varieties or other, or other crops. So just kind of some of note um, in vegetables, the winter radishes hold much better and store a lot longer than kind of the small radishes that we usually think of in kind of European Western society. Um, so these, these tend to be from East Asia um, and they're really, really good. They're phenomenal radishes. I like, I don't even grow the small radishes anymore. Um, but the, the Chinese white winter radish is probably my favorite and they can store like in the crisper drawer of your fridge for like three, four months and still be great. Um, there's uh, winter kohlrabi they're called. There's several varieties, but super schmelz is, um, is one that has done, uh, that's done pretty well for me. There's also storage cabbages, like there's just certain cabbages that, you know, if you look them up and you read them, um, they'll say that they were specifically for storage purposes, um, and they tend to store better. That's what they're bred for. Daikon radishes are kind of another similar kind of winter radish type um, radish that stores really well. Melons tend to store pretty well because they got that big thick rind, which is why they were bred to have that big thick rind is so that they store well. Uh, winter squash stores pretty well. Um, different winter squash store um, different lengths of time. So moshada squash do much better than pipo squash. Um, and most good nurseries and seed catalogs will label what species it is. Um, if that should not say C, it should say, oh, it should, sorry. <laughs> uh, so C is cucurbita, but usually you'll just see C period and then it would say either pipo or moshada or mixta um, or maxima, um, but moshada is are the ones that tend to store the best. So, and the one that stores just off the charts crazy a long amount of time is uh, the Seminole pumpkin, which was bred by the Seminole people um, in what is now Southern Florida, down in the Everglades, and it stores 
just insanely long. I, I had ones that I was just keeping around my house, like not refrigerated, just like hanging out in the kitchen uh, to see how long they would last. I cut the last one open and it was still good 22 months after I harvested it. Um, and it's not an exaggeration. It was 22 months after I harvested it, no refrigeration or anything. So like that made it really easy for me to grow a lot of pumpkins and not waste them because I could eat them over two years almost, which is much easier than if you get a bunch of pumpkins and you got to eat them within two months. Um, it's just, it's a lot easier. <clears throat> uh, mouse melon is another one that you might not have heard of. This is what they are. They look like little itty bitty watermelons. They taste like cucumbers, but they've got a pretty thick skin on them. So they, they tend to store a decently long amount of time. Uh, potatoes and sweet potatoes store really well. Garlic, uh, potato onions, uh, bulb onions as well. Uh, there's certain bulb onion varieties that store better than others. I don't know of one in particular, like I can't recommend one specifically, but there is variation there of which ones store longer. Uh, Trombencino squash stores really well, like even as a, as a summer squash, um, you know, like if you, if you have it sitting on your counter, uh, generally it won't rot, it'll just ripen, which is wild. Most squash don't do that, um, but it'll just ripen if you don't eat it in time and it'll just become a winter squash. Um, so Trombencino squash is, is stores much longer than like a zucchini or a patty pan or a crook neck, which tend to, to rot if they sit out too long. Um, whereas Trombencino just don't really do that. And then carrots and beets uh, are really good storing crops. Uh, store really well, especially in the fridge. Uh, they can store for months and months and months. Uh, when it comes to fruits, um, apples and pears are the ones that tend to store the best. They're the ones that were really bred for that. Um, they're really popular in you know, cold climates where they need storage so that they have fruits, produce, vegetables um, in the winter so that they don't die of scurvy. Um, so those were the main crops of like Northern Europe and um, colder parts of China as, as winter um, vitamin C sources. Generally speaking, if you're looking at like an apple or a pear cultivar and you're wanting one that like stores the longest, generally the later in the season it ripens, the better it is at storing. Um, and just as like an example, like there's some apples that ripen in like July, but if you talk to people who have them, they're all like, they're good, but you basically have to like pick it off the tree and eat it right there. Because if you like pick a bunch and take it to your house, they're probably going to be rotten by the time you get there. Like, and then just the later in the season you go, the longer they last until you get to some really late ripening ones like Enterprise and Gold Rush, which can store like in, in good conditions can store for like a year. And that's not an exaggeration as we'll talk about in a few slides. And then jujubes is another fruit that stores really well. It'll actually just dry on the tree even. If you leave it on there too long, it won't rot. It'll just dry on the tree. Um, and then you can kind of preserve it like you would a date or a raisin or something like that. So then harvesting the crops, which again seems very obvious, but just always got to point it out um, that, you know, keeping on top of harvesting is critical if you want to avoid food waste. Um, it can, uh, you know, prevent you from losing crops to things like bolting or being overly ripe. Um, so like with lettuce here, you know, we had this lettuce, it was beautiful. It didn't get harvested. We were like, oh, it'll be fine. It got hot it bolted, which is where it starts elongating and going to flower. And now this whole thing is trash. Like if, if you broke off the leaf, it would just start spewing out latex. It would taste incredibly bitter. Um, like you, you could still eat it, but it's not good. No, nope, like I haven't met anyone who enjoys bolted lettuce. Um, and so that's just, is wasted. Like you, you're just, you're not gonna eat that. Um, this is a brassica that didn't get harvested in time. I think it was a, probably a little broccoli or something. They didn't harvest it. And so it started flowering. You could eat the flowers, but like you lost the broccoli. Like you're not going to get that broccoli head. It's gone. So you want to keep on top of that. And actually keeping on top of harvesting can also actually increase your production. So things like green beans, for example, if you let all of your pole beans, like if you don't pick them and they all start maturing and turning into dry beans, um, the plant is not going to keep producing new young beans because its goal is to produce mature seeds. And so if it can do that, it's going to do that. But if you keep them picked off, it'll keep putting out those green beans because it hasn't achieved its goal yet. And so staying on top of harvesting can prevent food waste and also actually maximize the amount of food, um, which can be really nice. Um, and it can open up space for you to grow more food. 
So, you know, like if I had, if this lettuce had been harvested three weeks ago when it should have been, we then could have planted a summer crop there and it could have been growing for three weeks. Um, so, you know, just helps with that management as well. And then um, storing your harvest. So this is really critical too. If you wanna avoid waste, um, you really need to store your produce effectively. Um, and if you're not, the food can go bad much more quickly, which again, just makes it much harder to eat it um, and not waste it. So the biggest, uh, most important thing to know is that your goal when it comes to long storage is to cool it down. Um, some things don't need to be like real cold, you know, like a lot of like warm season things like tomatoes or peppers or eggplants don't need to be like refrigerated necessarily. Um, but you don't want it to be hundred degrees outside. Like if it's hundred degrees outside and you pick it, you want to bring it inside and bring it somewhere that's cool. Again, maybe not the fridge, but you know, much cooler than it is outside. Um, and you want to do that because fruits and vegetables are alive. They are a part of a plant. They are still alive. And because of that, since they are not attached to the plant that is photosynthesizing, it's not producing energy anymore, it is respiring. It's basically doing what we do as animals. It is breaking down the sugars, the things in its tissue, and actually off-gassing CO2 um, to do that. It's trying to keep itself alive by by consuming what it has in it. And that's why I like to see stuff start to shrivel and stuff. It's literally like eating itself. Well, but the cooler that it is, the slower that that process happens. So, um, so then this is a, a, a number for, for fruit specifically, um, but respiration in, in an apple happens 10 times faster at 60 degrees than it does at 32 degrees. And, that doesn't, and that's not a real big difference. So, I mean, you're thinking like in, in temperature, you know, versus like it could be hundred degrees outside, you know, in St. Louis. And so cooling your crops down is gonna, as, as quickly as possible, as in, you know, don't let it just sit outside for hours and hours, but like, you know, you harvest it, you bring it inside somewhere cool, um, can really prolong the amount of time that that produce will be, will be good for you. So the temperature is really critical, but also the humidity because, um, because it's because it's losing water as well through its tissue. And so if it's more humid, it's gonna lose that water more slowly versus if the air around it is really dry, it's gonna be losing water more quickly. It's gonna wilt faster. It's gonna dry out faster. It's gonna shrivel faster. And so um, the kind of perfect situation would be as cool as possible for the crop and also a really high humidity. So there's been uh, a lot of studies on apples because we wanna eat apples all year long. We wanna be able to go to the grocery store whenever we want and buy apples. But if you've ever grown apples, you know that at best apples are ripe from July through like November. So how are we going to the store and buying apples in May? <laughs> They're ones that were stored last fall. <laughs> it's not a fresh apple, I assure you. Um, and so there's been lots of studies of how to prolong their storage. And these are just, again, some numbers. So at 70 degrees, like room temperature, an apple will ripen, which is the, which is the point at which it has reached like peak, uh, like perfection of eating, and then it will start degrading within three days. At 30 degrees, apples take 30 days to ripen, like the exact same cultivar of apple, same other conditions, just that temperature difference changes it from three days to 30 days. Um, and at 30, degrees might sound crazy to you, but because of how much sugar are, are in apples, they actually don't freeze at 32 degrees. It has to be in the, the high 20s, as you can see here, before apples freeze. So you know, bring it close to that freezing point, but not all the way to freezing, because if you freeze it, that's a whole different thing. Freezing kills the, the tissue, and then, it's, and then it's, a whole, it's a whole different thing, which we'll talk about. Um, but, to sh but to show you that, there was you know, a study then that said at 30 to 32 degrees and 90 to 95% humid humidity, Jonathan Gold Delicious and Red Delicious could store and be like commercially viable to sell at the grocery store for three to five months. Like that's wild. And just an example. So this picture, it's a, it's a little shriveled up um, on this apple, but this is one that I just took like an hour ago, a picture of an apple that I took an hour ago from my setup for storing apples, this apple, which is still good. Again, it's a, little, it's a little shriveled, but like for cutting up, putting on oatmeal or things like that, it's still really good. I harvested this last October from an orchard here in Edwardsville, Illinois, uh, and it's still good. <laughs> it's still edible. That's um, uh, Gold Rush, which is like 
a phenomenal storing, storing apple. So again, like you could do that. And then that allowed me to buy a huge amount of local produce. And I've just been eating it all year. My whole family, we've been eating it all year long and we're still not done yet. We still have some, like we will probably have some until we go pick more apples. So then um, what does the storage actually look like? Like what is the ideal if you're gonna be storing produce? So again, some things like tomatoes, eggplants, um, peppers, basil, don't usually wanna be in the, in the refrigerator. Um, they can tolerate it to some extent, although basil really does not do good in the, the refrigerator. Um, but they generally do a little better at room temperature. Um, but almost all the other produce that you're gonna be growing, the refrigerator is kind of the best um, if you have the space to do that. Um, and, and that's if you're wanting to like eat them fresh, you know, if you want to like process or, you know, freeze or things like that, which we'll talk about, you know, then those would be better. But if you're like wanting a fresh produce and you want to keep it fresh as long as possible, the refrigerator is generally the best tool to do that. And because of humidity, you know, we said high humidity is also important. The refrigerator, the air in the refrigerator is incredibly dry because the compression cycle that's used to cool the air in the refrigerator also pulls out all the humidity. It's basically an air conditioner, like it's the same principle. Um, and so it pulls out the humidity as well. And that's gonna dry out your produce. So you wanna maintain that humidity. There's lots of different ways to do that, um, but like wrapping it in plastic or like a plastic grocery bag um, putting it in like a clamshell. This is why, you know, like a lot of produce is in plastic, although I hate plastic. That's why it's in there. You know, those clamshells, those little like plastic containers um, uh, or just like, you know, a Tupperware or reusable Tupperware or just the crisper drawer. That's why the crisper drawer is a thing. If you didn't know, it's because it's contained to hold the humidity for your produce. That's why they say like, put your produce there. Like that's, that's the whole reason. There's nothing special about the drawer. It just keeps the humidity in. Um, in that space to keep the produce better or longer. Uh, so just doing that where you're maintaining it, it's not just like laying loose in there. Um, paper bags um, help, but it's, it's still gonna dry out much more quickly in a paper bag than it would in plastic, unfortunately. Uh, there are some like waxed fabric things that you can use that are pretty effective, um, but it can be much hard, but it can be hard to wrap like large amounts of produce. Like you need a giant one to wrap like a head of cabbage or something. <clears throat> Uh, root crops can also be stored um, like in the basement um, or in like kind of wet sand, um, which you should look up. There's like ways to do that um, that I didn't, we don't really have time to go into, but like if you're wanting to store like a lot, um, that was traditionally how they were done in like root cellars and like damp sand and, and things like that. There's lots of other ways to store them. But for most people, the refrigerator is going to be your best bet in some sort of uh, container that is going to maintain um, humidity around that produce. Another thing that you can do, and this is how I store my apples, is you can modify a chest freezer. If you can find a chest freezer, there's a surprising number of them just floating around that people don't want, uh, or that you can get on like Craigslist for really cheap, um, or you know, Facebook Marketplace or whatever, um, that you can get pretty cheap, or even if you, if you buy one. Uh, their chest freezers are, you know, much more efficient because when you lift the thing up, the cold air is, is drops down. So it doesn't all pour out like it does if you open up like a stand up refrigerator or a stand up freezer. Um, and they make these little contraptions. They're like 20 to 40 bucks uh, online that you can find them uh, that you plug that into the wall and then you plug the chest freezer into that item and then you set whatever temperature you want and it will turn off and on the compressor on the chest freezer and you can turn it basically into a refrigerator. But because it's a freezer, it's got way more insulation and so it ends up being way more efficient than a refrigerator. Um, like this one that I have has been running for like a year, like the, like the cycle to cool will turn on like once or twice a day. Um, it's just, it's very efficient when you got all that insulation from a freezer. And I can set it to like, like I, I had apples in there. So I set it to 31 degrees. Um, and like I said, I put this whole freezer was full. I had over a hundred pounds of apples um, that were in there like last October. And this is the last crate. This is what I'm down to. You can see this one, this one here is rotten a little bit. Um, but I got this like whole crate here still that we're going through. Um, and you saw, you know, that picture on the last slide, there's still pretty good. And so, but you could also do that same idea if you're wanting to store cabbage or a lot of carrots or, you know, I mean, really anything else you would want to do, you would just want to set the temperature 
um, appropriately. You know, you wouldn't want to go below 32 for for most things because that's going to freeze them. Um, apples are kind of a special case because they have so much uh, sugar in them. Uh, so, so like I said here, Gold Rush and Enterprise are the two that I really like that um, that store really long. But there's other apples that are good stores as well. And then pears also store um, pretty well. As far as I know, they don't store as long as apples. But it would be the same idea that you would um, that you would do. Um, but but you're you don't need to store your food fresh. You know, there's other ways to keep food good um, so that you don't waste it, so that you can eat it over a longer period of time. Freezing, I think we're all you know pretty familiar with how freezing works, um, but freezing is a great way to store things for a longer period um, than would be possible fresh or in the refrigerator, uh, but it changes the texture. So like if you're, you know, I wanna, you know, have fruit and I'm gonna freeze it and then I'm gonna thaw it and like eat a nice crisp apple, you know, that's not gonna happen. It's gonna make it soft. So it tends to be better as a way to preserve things that you are going to be cooking with um, or that you're gonna make a frozen kind of treat out of. Um, so especially fruit, you know, oftentimes fruit is mostly eaten fresh um, in our culture, but there's lots of other ways to eat fruit. Um, and there's some ways, you know, where they store frozen really well. You can make like a puree out of your fruit and store it as like an applesauce. Uh, but you can also have a pear sauce or a peach sauce or like you can just like eat purees if you want. Uh, but you could also use those purees to make popsicles or uh, flavor ice cream or to make sorbet. Um, and then there's also lots of stuff that you can do with fermenting and canning, which are like whole individual classes on their own. Uh, but those are also options just for for storage. Uh, the one thing that I am going to talk about a little bit in terms of other storage options is is drying. So drying is the oldest and simplest preservation technique and it stores food for the longest period of time. Um, although some people would say fermenting uh, might, might be able to last things longer, um, make things last longer. Uh, generally speaking, drying is a very shelf stable, very easy way for people um, to get into to food preservation and make their food last longer. So many herbs dry really well. You know, a lot of herbs we buy dried in the first place, but especially, um, you know, things that you can grow, uh, rosemary, oregano, thyme, parsley, stevia, sage, um, all do well dried and the flavor stays pretty good dried. Things like basil generally and cilantro are generally not very good dried. Um, turmeric and ginger can, can be grown here as annuals and you can dry uh, the roots. You can also dry the leaves. The leaves are edible and kind of ground up and it can be like a powdered um, you know, flavoring. Uh, it's nowhere near as strong as the roots, but they are edible. Um, and then like onions and garlic, you can make you know, onion powder, garlic powder, um, but also the scapes of garlic. If you've ever grown garlic, you know, the little curly cue things, you kind of get those all at once and you can't eat them, but it can be a little overwhelming. You can also dry those and grind them up and it's like a garlic powder, but it's a garlic skate powder. Um, works pretty well. Chives also dry pretty well. Another thing is if you, if it's, if there's food that you're eating kind of mashed or pureed, you can like do that, like cook it, puree it, and then dry that puree and then grind it into a flour and then store it that way and you can just rehydrate it. It's like the same idea as like instant potatoes, except you know, you're making them yourself. So you can do it like with potatoes or sweet potatoes or pumpkins or you know, butternut squash. Um, you can also do it with trombancino squash so, or like zucchini, like a summer squash, which might sound weird, uh, but actually uh, summer squash pureed mixed in with like mashed potatoes is really good. It like lightens up the mashed potatoes a little bit. It's really, really good. Um, if you have woody okra pods, like if your okra got too big and it's hard and woody, you can dry that and then grind it into a powder um, and it acts as like a thickening agent for your food. Like if you're like using, if you need like thickening for soup or something, instead of using like a starch or like a wheat flour, you can use like ground up okra pods. Um, we'll do a similar thing. Dried sweet corn tastes like candy. It's amazing. Um, uh, daylily buds are edible and you can dry them. Um, at that point, they're called golden needles in East Asian cuisine. Um, and they're really good in, in soups. It's like a, a like kind of rich, kind of savory flavor in soups. Uh, jujubes, when they're dried, uh, they're, jujubes are also called Chinese dates because that's how you can use them. You can use them just like a date. If you dry them and you kind of chop them up, um, you can throw them into food and they're just you know very sweet. Again, 
just like you would use a date is how you would use it. And then with pretty much all fruit, you can make fruit leather. So if you puree fruits, like if you make like an applesauce and then you kind of lay it, like spread it on like a sheet um, really thin and then you dehydrate it, you dry it, uh, it's, it's a fruit roll up basically, except it's real food. Um, and, and then you can just, you know, peel it off the sheet once it's dry, roll it up, and you got a fruit roll up. Or if you cut it into little, you know, smaller things, it's fruit by the foot, except it's fruit and not just corn syrup. And you can do that with, with any fruit. Um, apples and pears are the ones that you'll see the most, but you could technically do it with anything. And this is just a picture that I show too. Uh, and I've actually, this is not a picture of my vehicle, but I've done this before in my vehicle that cars get really hot in the summer and I've actually dehydrated food on a window screen sitting in my car in a parking lot. It worked alarmingly well. And then my car smelled amazing because I was dehydrating like blueberries. My car smelled like blueberries for days. So another thing um, to think about here is just the idea that, you know, you want to eat as much of the things that you're harvesting as, as possible. Uh, and that's a big way to reduce waste. And this is a thing uh, that was really brought to my attention by a woman who used to work here uh, named Punita, who was really good at... Uh, showing me all the things that I was throwing away that were actually food and that she would eat and showed me how to do it. Uh, and she is great. Uh, so just examples of some things that you maybe didn't know you could eat that you can, that are, uh, that might be coming out of your garden are the leek greens. Uh, the green part of the leek, usually we throw that away and we're like, gross, they're too tough. And they are really tough. But there are ways, you know, if you cook them for a really long time, they do have really good flavor or they're really good in like stocks or things like that. Um, the leaves of carrots are actually edible. And especially when they're really little, they're delicious and they taste just like the root. Um, but the bigger ones are also edible. Uh, we make a lot of our pestos are actually carrot green based that, uh, that we eat because we always end up with a lot of carrot greens. Radish greens are edible and are very, very similar to turnip greens or mustard greens in their flavor. Uh, beet greens are edible. Beets and uh, chard are the exact same species. Uh, beet greens pretty much taste like chard. Uh, turnip greens are also edible. The leaves on the top of your turnips are edible. There's also turnip green like varieties that are bred just for the leaves, but the leaves of the turnip root is edible because again, they're the exact same. They're the same. They're the same species. Like the turnip green cultivar, like varieties, and the turnip root varieties, they're the same species. It's just some of them were selected for bigger leaves, some of them were selected for bigger roots. So the leaves on those are also edible. Um, the potato peels, like when you like peel all the, you know, the skin off your potatoes, um, you can actually like roast those in the oven, like toss them with like oil and salt and pepper and roast them in the oven. And they're like little potato chips. They're, they're actually pretty good. Uh, squash and pumpkin seeds, uh, which a lot of people know, but maybe don't think about it, but like all squash seeds um, are edible. You can, you know, salt them, roast them. Uh, they taste just like the pumpkin seeds from the store because they pretty much are. Uh, melon seeds are also edible. Despite the legends you heard as a child, you know, when you eat a watermelon seed, it's not gonna sprout in your stomach. Uh, it will digest and give you some energy though. They're really good. And there's actually types of watermelons that are bred for seed production. Um, they're much more popular in Africa, which is where watermelons originally um, are from, uh, but you can eat the seeds of any watermelon if you want, um, and they're going to be good. Uh, melon rinds, like watermelon rinds, are also edible, believe it or not. Usually you don't just want to eat it because it's not real great that way, um, but there's uh, like watermelon rind pickles that you can make. There's rind parmesan. I don't really know what that is, honestly. I just kept finding people talking about it. I have never tried it, so I can't vouch for that. But uh, watermelon rind pickles are, are pretty good if you like pickles. Uh, believe it or not, sweet corn cobs, like after you eat all the sweet corn off, you can boil that in water and it makes the water this like sweet kind of flavor. And then you can make a jelly out of that. It's called corn cob jelly and it tastes exactly like honey. It's really good. Um, your thinned seedlings too. Almost all of the seedlings, you know, there's some summer stuff um, that they tell you not to eat the the leaves of but like all your spring stuff especially if you're like thinning out like lettuce seedlings eat them it's lettuce um or if you're thinning out you know 
beet seedling, you know, any of these things where I'm saying the greens are edible, like just, just eat the seedlings too. They're, they're microgreens. That's what microgreens are. Uh, also, and this isn't something that would be coming out of your garden probably, but uh, if you have citrus, the peels, you know, there's the zest on the outside, you can zest those, you know, kind of scrape off the colorful skin, which has really strong, potent flavor. Uh, and you can use that right away in your cooking, or you can also dry it and then store it and use it later. And then the rind, uh, just the whole like skin of citrus is also edible. Uh, most people don't like the flavor of it, but uh, you can candy it, which is where you like boil it in like a simple sugar uh, or a simple syrup. And that's so good. <clears throat> With fruit, uh, there's a couple things. So like apples and pears, you know, when you're processing those, you probably end up with a lot of cores and peels. Um, you can actually juice those if you have a steam juicer. You wouldn't want to run a core through like a, like a grinding kind of juicer because it's going to grind up the seeds and stuff too and the seeds are not good for you or edible. Um, but if you have a steam juicer, which is a way to like basically steam the juice out of it, um, it kind of produces a lot of hot steam, which makes the cells break and the juice just kind of falls down into, into a container. Um, you can just throw all those cores and peels in there and juice it. And then you get, and then you get some juice. So like the last time that my wife processed a whole bunch of apples, you know, we process, you know, I don't, I don't remember how much it was. It was a bunch of apples. And then we just steam juiced like the cores and the peels. And we got like a half a gallon of juice out of it, um, which, you know, we otherwise just would have thrown all that away. You can also make apple cider vinegar, which you can do from the juice, or uh, there's, you know, I got all sorts of instructions online in terms of like, you know, filling up a container with cores and peels and adding water and some stuff to start fermenting and make apple cider vinegar. Uh, you can also make apple jelly, which again would be kind of the same idea where you're either boiling the cores or you're juicing the cores and then making jelly from the juice. Um, you can, there's recipes online for these things called cinnamon, uh, for cinnamon apple syrup. Uh, which you can make from the cores and the peels. And then you can also do kind of similar to what I was talking about with the potato peels, where you kind of flavor and then kind of roast uh, the apple peels. And you can get these like kind of cinnamon sugar dried like apple peel sticks that are that are also pretty good. Uh, strawberry tops, like when you cut the, the top off the strawberry, the green, but there's also like a little bit of fruit still attached usually when you do that. Uh, you can also juice those. Like if you're processing a whole bunch of strawberries and you got a bunch of them, you can pop them in that steam juicer and juice them. Um, and then the, the cutoff, you know, if you're cutting off parts of fruit um, that are buggy or that are just kind of, you know, not appealing looking, you can also juice those. It's why apple cider exists <laughs> um, is because farmers needed to figure out what to do with all the buggy and not pretty fruit. And they figured out, hey, if I juice it and then turn it into alcohol, people don't care what the apples look like. Um, it doesn't have to be alcoholic cider, but um, it always was <laughs> in the past. And so, uh, so you can also, you know, you can juice those, those kind of nasty, you know, if it's like real gross and there's like bug poop everywhere, probably not those bits, but you know, other things that you're like, oh, this doesn't really look nice. Juice it. Uh, there's also things that many people just don't know are edible. Uh, so those other things are like kind of like bits of like things that you're already kind of harvesting or kind of waste of things that you're already harvesting. But there's other parts of plants that maybe you didn't know were edible. So horseradish, usually we eat the horseradish root, but the horseradish leaves are also edible. They taste exactly the same. You can kind of chop them up, put them in a salad, gets that little bit of a horseradishy kind of kick to it. Um, fava beans, if you've ever grown them, they're not super common in the St. Louis area, but fava, fava bean leaves are edible and you can eat those. Pea leaves, like pea greens are edible. So these are shoots, like the tender growing um, tips of peas are edible and really good. Uh, tomato greens and pepper leaves are also edible, believe it or not. Um, you don't wanna like make a salad out of them, uh, but they're good for, for like in small amounts to make like pestos and stuff. You can find recipes online. There's also a book called the CSA Cookbook um, that's really good that talks about um, making pestos out of a lot of these um, less common uh, leaves that most people don't think about. Um, grape leaves are edibles. It's what the wrapper of dolmas are. Um, so you can eat those. Sweet potato leaves are also edible and really, really good. Um, sesame leaves, if you're ever growing sesame seeds, which you're probably not, but if you are, the leaves are also edible. Um, they're consumed as is like a, more of like a flavoring or kind of spice 
um, in Korea in particular, probably other places as well. Uh, squash leaves and shoots uh, are edible. That's what this picture down here on the bottom right, um, which is from the forager chef um, shows. So these are like kind of the tender growing tips of squash that's kind of stir fried into this dish and the blossoms of squash are edible. You can kind of stuff them with cream cheese and flavoring and stuff and then um, uh, bread them and batter them and they're real good. Uh, every part of all brassicas are edible. So, you know, if you grow, so like cabbage, collards, kale, broccoli, cauliflower, kohlrabi, and Brussels sprouts, are all, believe it or not, the exact same plant. They are the exact same species. And so, you know, you can eat the leaves on kale. You can also eat the leaves on all those other ones. You can eat the, the like little leaves on cabbage. You don't have to just eat the head. You can eat the leaves on broccoli. You can eat the leaves on cauliflower. So you can harvest the heads and then you can also harvest those leaves. They're edible. They're not poisonous. They're not gonna hurt you. They tend to be more tough, so they'll need to be cooked longer, or they're really good as wraps. If you like like lettuce wrap type things, uh, because they're, they're tougher, they're thicker, they make really good wraps for things. Um, but all those are edible. Also the flowers on those are edible. The immature seed pods are edible. The stems on all of those are edible. Um, you can eat the whole dang plant. They're often tough, so you might wanna look at like what, like you might wanna look up recipes for those specific things and you'll find lots of good ones online, but those are all edible. Herb flowers, like the flowers of, you know, garlic chives and, you know, onion chives and uh, basil and, you know, all, like all these herbs, they're edible. Uh, you can eat them. Nasturtiums, if you've ever grown nasturtiums, it's, it's more of usually like a flower, but they're, they're planted as a companion plant sometimes in the vegetable garden. The leaves are edible. They're like, it's like a real strong kind of peppery flavor um, that I think is pretty good. Uh, but also the flowers are edible and the pods, the immature seed pods, you can pickle and they are called poor man's capers and you can use them just like you would capers. Uh, the flowers of day lilies are edible. The pods of radishes, the immature pods, um, which is this picture up here are edible. They're real spicy like a radish. Um, garlic scapes, which we talked about, like the curly cue that comes out of the top of garlic sometimes are edible. Um, garlic and elephant garlic greens, like the green leaves, like if you have an extra one or you want to cut it down or something, I don't know. You can eat the leaves as well or use them as a, a flavoring. And then cilantro, the roots are also edible on cilantro. Wild. Um, so you can dig those up, wash them and you know, chop them up and they're, and they're going to taste very similar to the, to the leaves. Um, so ways to use scraps. Um, scraps from sweet things are great to save for smoothies. So those are just some examples there. You can grind them up and make lots of different smoothies um, for a lot of your kind of fruit scraps. Um, for more like kind of savory things, like your vegetable scraps, and I'm talking like peels, the bottoms, the like leaves of celery, the skins of onions, the like tough stalks of broccoli or kale or something like that, or like the bottoms of mushrooms, or you know the little, the little bitty top of carrot that you cut off. Those are all things that are technically edible, but are not real appealing to people, but they are great for making vegetable stock. You know, just boil the heck out of them forever. And there's, you know, there's recipes online you'd look up because you usually add some salt and some other things, but just boil the heck out of them. And you get a lot of the nutrients out of those things um, and into those, those broths and stocks that you can make to then cook with is a great way to use a lot of those kind of weird scraps that are, that are edible. Um, I'm sorry, I know I'm running out of time here. So uh, just a couple other random things. If you have bones, like if, you, you know, if you're a meat eater and you got you know, chicken bones, beef bones, whatever, you can save those like in the freezer uh, and make bone broth once you get a bunch. We do that periodically um, where we'll you know, freeze a whole bunch. And then when we're like, oh my gosh, this is taking up way too much space in the fridge, we just make a big old batch of bone broth. Um, and then what's left over when you do that, you can grind it up and it's bone meal and it's great in the garden as a fertilizer. If you have some like extra milk, if you're like, oh, this milk's starting to go bad, I need to do something. I have never done this, but I met someone who did where you can make cheese out of it. There's like, you can find recipes online for vinegar cheese. Don't know how great it is, but you could, you could do that to use it up. Uh, and although I'm always kind of iffy about this, um, you can also grow more food in some ways, like the, 
like you'll find things of like the base of celery if you stick it in water it'll send up some new leaves it'll do that i have never been real successful of like actually like getting those to root and then transplanting them into soil and like really getting a whole plant growing but you could potentially do that um, pineapple tops though is how you propagate pineapples so if you wanted to try and grow pineapples you could take the top of a pineapple root it and grow a pineapple it's a as a house plant it's not going to survive our winter and then you know if you're not able to find food uses for these things there's stuff that you still end up with there's some things uh that will be food scraps that make uh, good fertilizers in the garden so like fish scraps if you got any like I don't know, you like processing whole fish or if you're a fisherman and you're you know, cutting off the heads and the guts and the skin and stuff like that. If you grind those up, which I mean, sounds real gross, but if you get a blender from Goodwill or something and you blend that up into a slurry, that's what fish emulsions is. And then you can you know, spray it on your garden, spread it on your garden. It's a great fertilizer. Your eggshells are really good if you stick them in the bottom of the hole before you plant your tomatoes or your peppers and then you just plant it right on top of those crushed up eggshells, you will not get blossom end rot and your tomatoes or your peppers. Um, it's great. If you have any extra kind of yogurt or kefir um, sitting around, you can actually dilute those. I think it's like two to three ounces per gallon of water um, and then spray it on the foliage of your plants and it can help um, as like a way to inoculate those good bacteria onto your plants, which can help with some diseases, not all, but some. And then I will say I have not done this one, but I know some, uh, there's some people out there that are like pretty, pretty knowledgeable who told me that uh, they actually spray their plants with, with soda, specifically colas, um, because they have a lot of phosphorus, or not a huge amount, but they have phosphorus in them. Uh, like there's phosphoric acid in a lot of, of sodas. And so it can actually be a decent foliar phosphorus fertilizer. So if you've got, you know, some soda that goes flat or something, or you got, you know, visitors come over and they drink half a can of soda and then they, you know, the rest of it is just sitting there and you're like, I'm not gonna drink this, it's somebody else's. You can kind of save that. Um, and again, you do like just a couple ounces in like a gallon of water, spray it on your plants. Um, and it's a little, little phosphorus boost for them. And then some things, you know, again, like milk or whey, um, can also be used as a fungicide on your plants or as a foliar fertilizer as well, um, but as a fungicide. Uh, so that would be um, a quarter cup of milk or whey at a minimum. You can add more. You can do up to just straight milk on your plants. It's not going to hurt them. But a minimum of about a quarter cup of milk or whey per gallon of water and then sprayed on your plants that are susceptible to fungal diseases and it'll help prevent those fungal diseases. So things like cucumbers that get a lot of powdery mildew, if you kind of spray them with milk before the powdery mildew shows up, it's gonna help prevent that mildew from getting established. If you have any old beer sitting around, it can be useful for killing slugs. I have never had slug issues, so I don't have personal experience with that, um, but it's a very common thing that people will tell you and they all swear it's very, very effective. And then kind of, you know, the last kind of options here is you can also convert it to new food. Uh, you can feed it to livestock. So chickens will eat just about anything you will. Generally speaking, they're not going to eat stuff in the onion family and they're not going to eat citrus. Um, and you definitely don't want to be feeding them chicken <laughs> um, or other kind of meat products for the most part, but other, but like vegetables um, that you would eat, they're going to eat those. So you can, you can feed that to them. Um, and they can then convert it into eggs. So they can, you know, so that food is still being turned into food. Um, and this is pictures of, you know, watermelon rinds. You know, if you don't want to pickle them or whatever, you can give them to the chickens and the chickens will eat basically everything but that little thin green skin on the outside. They'll eat all of that flesh on there. Um, they'll also eat weeds from your garden. Uh, you can also raise crickets. Again, I have, I have not done that, but that is a thing that is possible. Um, and they can also eat like vegetable scraps and stuff as well. Uh, if you cannot do that, you can feed them to worms. You can do like vermicomposting, which is a type of composting. Um, but the thing that's just maybe slightly a little better if you're looking at reducing food waste um, is that they can, they can compost that food and then your excess worms you could feed to your chickens who can then turn them into eggs. Um, but uh, there's lots of ways to do composting. And so composting is, is kind of the, the last good resort. Um, so if you can't eat it directly or it's like rotten, you know, if it's stuff that you can't feed to your chickens, um, you know, compost it. And then you use that compost to improve the soil quality and fertility um, of your soil 
to boost food production without having to buy in um, fertilizers or, or other things can be quite helpful. So that is about it. So thank you everyone. Um, and I will be happy to take questions now.